Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Sri Hare Hey, Hey, Hari His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Raj Granta Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai, Harinam Sankirtan Ki Jai, Vitai Gaur Prem Randi. Glories to the assembled devotees, glories to the assembled devotees, glories to Sri Guru and Sri Gauranga. Hare Krishna Maha Mantra Ki Jai.
public service announcement. It's free. No commercials. Is that one thing we should understand, and uh, I mentioned it to Nityananda Pran, he also recognizes it, that we don't offer flower petals to Srila Prabhupada while the prayers to the you know, Lord are still going on. We wait until the prayers are over, then we begin the Guru Puja, and then we begin offering flower petals. It's like simultaneously worshipping the Guru and the Lord at the same time. So... Um, and this is done in all temples, that they wait until the prayers are over, and then a garland is given right after that, and then the petals are offered like that. So, in order to keep the etiquette, it's nice. Prabhupada is worshipping the Lord during those prayers, and then we're offering petals to Prabhupada at the same time, so it's not so... The etiquette is not correct. <laughs> Okay, so I'll try to refrain from that. Uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, fifth canto, ninth chapter. The chapter is entitled The Island of Jambudweep. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya This is text number 6 Navaisa Atmatma Vatam Surittama Navaisa Atmat Mavatam Surit Surittama Saktas Trilokyam Bhagavan Vasudevaha Nastri Kritam Kasmalam Asnuvita Na Lakshmananam la, Na Lakshmanam Chapi Vihatum Arhati <coughs> Na Vaisa Atmam Mavatam Surittama Saktas Trilokyam Bhagavan Vasudevaha <coughs> Nastri Kritam Kasmalam Asnu Vritta Na Lakshmanam Chapi Vihatum Arhati Na Vaisa Atma Mavatam Surittama Saktas Trilokyam Bhagavan Vasudevaha Nastri Kritam Kasmalam Asnuvita Na Lakshmanam Chapi Vihatum Arhati
ladies. Na, not, by, indeed, sa, he, atma, the supreme soul, atvat, atm, atma vatam, of the self-realized souls, suritamaha, the best friend, sakta, attached, Sri lokyam, to anything within the three worlds. Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Vasudevaha, the all-pervading Lord. Na, not, Sri Kritam, obtained because of his wife. Kasmalam, sufferings of separation. Asnuvita would obtain na not Lakshmanam his younger brother Lakshmana Cha also Api certainly Vihatum to give up Arhati be able Translation purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Translation, since Lord Ramachandra is the Supreme Personality of Godhead Vasudeva, He is not attached to anything in this material world. He is the most beloved super soul of all self-realized souls, and He is their very intimate friend. He is full of all opulences. Therefore, he could not possibly have suffered because of separation from his wife, nor could he have given up his wife and Lakshman, his younger brother. To give up either would have been absolutely impossible. Report. In defining the Supreme Personality of Godhead, we say that he is full in all six opulences. Wealth, fame, strength, influence, beauty, and renunciation. He is called renounce because he is not attached to anything in this material world. Everyone is reading. When you're reading, also make sure you hear, because hearing is actually higher than reading. So the hearing process is what goes to the heart, you know. So you listen carefully and you get much more than looking at the words, you know. That's Prabhupada's strong instruction. <laughs> He is called renounced because he is not attached to anything in this material world. He is specifically attached to the spiritual world and to the living entities there. The affairs of the material world take place under the superintendence of Durga Devi. Srishti Stiti Palaya Sadasaktir Ekam Chayeva Yasha Bhuvana Nibhivati Durga. Everything is going on under the strict rules and regulations of the material energy represented by Durga. Therefore, the Lord is completely detached and need not give attention to the material world. Sita Devi belongs to the spiritual world. Similarly, Lord Lakshmana, Ramachandra's younger brother, is a manifestation of Sankarsana, and Lord Ramachandra himself is Vasudeva, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Since the Lord is always spiritually qualified, he is attached to servants who will always render transcendental loving service unto him. 
He is attached to truth in life, not to Brahminical qualities. Indeed, he is never attached to any material qualities. Although he is the super soul of all living entities, he specifically manifests to those who are self-realized, and he is especially dear to the hearts of his transcendental devotees. Because Lord Ramachandra descended to teach human society how dutifully a king should be, he apparently gave up the company of Mother Sita and Lakshmana. Factually, however, he could not have given them up. One should therefore learn about the activities of Lord Ramachandra from a self-realized soul. Then one can understand the transcendental activities of the Lord. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gena Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruvena Maha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadanti Swampadanti Kam Jayasi Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasadi Gaur Bhaktarindam Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. One of the characteristics of the Supreme Lord is that he is achintya, and that is inconceivable. Apparently what we see and try to understand and analyze, analyze, may be completely different than what is actually happening. <laughs> Therefore, in relationship to the Lord, one has to hear about the Lord from those who are fully transcendentally realized. Not just a great soul, but someone who was actually fully transcendentally realized. Otherwise, one will misunderstand in fact, it's common to misunderstand the Lord because we generally the conditioned souls measure everything according to their own experiences, understandings, intellects, and various other means for accumulating knowledge. But the Lord is transcendental to all these systems of understanding. He is in his own realm of existence and he performs activities for different reasons. Generally, the main reason why he performs activities is for his own transcendental pleasure. Just like, to give you an example of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, we understand that he appeared for six transcendental reasons. Three of them are for his own purposes, and three were for the benefit of the conditioned souls in this material world. Now the internal, what we say, purposes are considered to be the reasons why he descends, and the external are simply means in order to bring about some particular change or te teach a particular example. Just like the main reason why Lord Chaitanya appeared is not to spread the Hare Krishna mantra. <laughs> That is not the main reason. Acharya has explained the main reason was to experience Radharani's love for himself. <laughs> that is the foremost of all reasons. To spread the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra was secondary, but also very essential, of course. And we understand that, that when Advaita Acharya called Lord Chaitanya to appear in this world, it just so happened and Dwight Acharya called in order to bring about a change in the population, to bring them to transcendental consciousness. It just so happened it was the same time the Lord had already decided to come and perform his activities in the mood of Radharani. It simultaneously occurred. So, so here also, the Lord performs particular activities. Now here it's mentioned that he could not have given up his wife. He could not have given up his brother. It's impossible. That's what the verse says. Absolutely impossible. Because the loving relationship between the Lord and his transcendental associates and his pure devotees are so deep and so strong, there's no question of ever giving them up. <laughs> but in order to teach a particular lesson, 
he did that. He did that in order to teach certain religious principles according to time, place, and circumstance. So unless we hear and understand that, we will find, we'll misunderstand. A lot of time what is written or even explained may not give a complete understanding of the actual situation that is occurring. For example, when Lord Ramachandra, after he had returned from uh, the forest and again was king of Ayodhya, or was king of Ayodhya, he had the policy of going around in a very disguised way just to hear what the citizens were saying about him. He wanted to understand if there was any discrepancy in his rules so he could correct that discrepancy. That's the quality of a great leader. There should be no discrepancy in his character, no discrepancy in the way he manages the affairs. Now, in today's society, there is only discrepancy. <laughs> Nothing else, practically. So, one day he was walking in a disguised way, and he heard a man chastising his wife. And the man was very upset that his wife had left the sh his shelter and had stayed all out all night without him knowing it. And therefore, this was against the principles of chastity for a married woman. So, the man was chastising his wife very strongly, and he used the example that I am not like Lord Ramachandra, whose wife was taken by another man, and he takes her back. <laughs> when Ram heard that, he started to think, oh, okay. So there's some discrepancy in my rule. What Ramachandra did was not wrong. But still, because of their apparent discrepancy on a lower level, not on the higher level, the higher level is that the Lord did test the chastity of Sita, and she did pass the test. We understand that as she came out of the fire, untouched by the fire. So her chastity was proven. But this man still found fault, not knowing the whole situation. Therefore, Ramchandra decided to, what we say, banish Sita. And for Sita, that was very, very difficult. And for Lakshmana also. Because Sita was pregnant at the time. And therefore, she was just about to deliver two very illustrious children. But not telling her, Ramachandra said to Lakshman, take, La take Sita to Valmiki Muni's ashram and let her stay there. Lakshman didn't want to do it. <laughs> Because he had, he understood what was correct and he understood how deep the loving relationship was between Sita and Ram. And therefore, but being in the position of obedience to his older brother, he protested, but the Lord was insistent. He had to obey. And in a very emotional and very distraught state of consciousness, he took Mother Sita to, you know, like the ashram. Sita didn't know what was happening, but when finally she understood through Lakshman's emotional, what we say, unhappiness, and then it was revealed that she wasn't coming back. Now, of course, there was another reason, but that same person who found fault with Ramchandra later appeared again in Krishna Leela as the washerman who found fault with Krishna because Krishna was was had asked about the clothes when he wanted those clothes which were the clothes of Kamsa and the washerman became very angry and Krishna just took his hand and cut off his head <laughs> Ram didn't do that because Ram was fine was following a certain etiquette of religious principles, teach, teaching righteousness according to truthfulness and honor. And so, but Krishna, you know, Krishna doesn't pl obey any rules. His only rule is, is whatever he wants to do. <laughs> and that's great, because it's nice to know a person like that who does what he wants, and it's always right. <laughs> he doesn't answer to anybody. <laughs> that's Krishna. <laughs> 
So, uh, but he always does the right thing. It's never he does the. It looks like the wrong thing from our perspective. Or it looks like something immoral. He encouraged Arjun to fight. He he made a peaceful man become a, a fighter. <laughs> and he's criticized. For, Krishna's criticized for so many things. <laughs> People find fault with Krishna. But Ram is so righteous. But at the same time, he Ram was feeling as much brokenheartedness in sending Sita away as Sita was feeling separation from Ram. In fact, even more so. Um, because he did it for a particular reason. But his loving relationship with, with Sita and his brother also, Lakshmana, as it says here, it's impossible they could give each other up. <laughs> what we have in this world as the emotions, feelings, and activities that go on are intensified in its fullest capacity in the in the position of the Lord. So whatever love we have, we can imagine what, what is the nature of God's love. God's love is so great and so powerful. And his love is pure. And his love is always, what we say, for the benefit of the object that the exchange of love is like that. So it wasn't for Sita's benefit to go away. <laughs> Because she had to deliver children, and those children never saw their father, because Ram had left the planet right after that. So it was pretty amazing, but there was a reason, and the Lord followed the etiquette. You know, when his father told him to go to the forest, because of the Man Manvantara, not what was it, Mantara? the um, hunchback assistant of Kaikei, when she was envious of Ram having the throne because her maid, sir, her master was Kaikei. Kaikei was the uh, mother of Bart, and therefore Koshaya's son would get the throne. That was Ram. So it looked like, you know, it was simply an intrigue. But out of righteousness and obedience to his father, who didn't want to do it, but his father, father it says for a kshatriya. See, you got you got two things going. You got the codes of religious principles, which are the virtues and glories of the good qualities, and then you have what is called the varna principles. So the varna principles are that a kshatriya never breaks their word. They will give up their life before they break their word, like that. That's the principles of a kshatriya. When Arjun was, uh, when Abhimanyu was killed on the battlefield unfairly by the Kurus who surrounded him, seven Maharatis defeated this one Maharati. Arjun, when he came back and found that was happened, he decided to kill Dryadroth, which was the person who killed him. Or if he refused, if he couldn't kill Dryadroth, then he would enter into the fire. He would give up his life. And he was ready to do that. That's how much his honor. But Krishna protected him, even though Dryadroth could not be killed. But Krishna arranged it. Krishna cheated it. Haribo. Krishna cheated in order to save his devotee. This is the this is the glory of Krishna. He'll break his promise. He'll look like somebody who's you know not really together, <laughs> in order to to save his devotee. This is Krishna. Because during that fight, I'm switching from leelas to leelas. I hope you don't mind. Now, during that fight. All the core of us surrounded Jayadwath because they thought if Arjun gives up his life, then there's no question of us not winning the battle because Arjun is the most formidable opponent. Therefore, if he gives up his life, we'll easily destroy the, in the Pandavas in the fight. So all the great Maharatis, including Durodhani, Duryodhana, and they all surrounded Jayadwath to make sure he wasn't killed, and they put him all the way on the other end of the battlefield. And the battlefield was 28 miles long. And Arjun was fighting, and he was trying to get to Jayadroth, and all the other soldiers were blocking. 
but he fought so fiercely that he broke through all these other ones. But finally, when he came to the last area, it was getting towards the end of the day. And according to Kshatriya codes, you can't fight after sunset. When the sun goes down, the battle stops. So the Korvas knew that if we could pr protect Jayadrath till the sun goes down, then Arjuna would have to enter the fire. So the sun, what Krishna did is he played a trick on the Kauravas. He made it appear that the sun was going down. And he covered the sun with a cloud to make it look like the sun was setting. And when, the, when it apparently seemed that the suns were setting, all the Korvas said, Jai! Arjun's going to have to enter the fire. We saved Jayadrath. And then what Krishna did was he then lifted the cloud and the sun was still up and he told Arjun, now get him. <laughs> Arjun was very sharp and he immediately killed him. So the sun hadn't gone down, but it, Krishna just cheated. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so when you have Krishna on your side, there's no problem. He'll even cheat for you. <laughs> so take shelter of Krishna. <laughs> Like that, so it's therefore you can we can never understand the reason why the Lord does something unless we hear from the transcendental lips of the great souls, and that's why Mahajano Yena Katasupata. This verse is so important because it under, it says that only in the hearts of great souls do true religious principles lie. So this is important. A lot of times people like to understand transcendental knowledge through reading books. And reading books are important and essential. But unless one takes shelter of Krishna's pure devotee, engages in devotional service, one does not come to the stage of purification. One can make advancement, but only by the blessings of and the service to the pure devotee does one become purified because the pure devotee is connected deeply with Krishna and therefore, by his mercy, one makes it spiritual advancement, not by intellectual knowledge here. And just like it says here, the Lord is not inclined to anything other than the pure love of his devotees, like that. And that's what attracts Krishna the loving relationship with his devotees, like that. So this is a very interesting point. That's a very interesting subject here, that it's very difficult to understand the Lord, but it's very easy also at the same time. That's another nature of transcendental philosophy. Something is both difficult and easy. Difficult if we don't approach it in the right way. Easy when we follow the principle. Therefore, the principle is complete devotion and shelter to Krishna's pure devotee. Therefore, what is the devotee's, what is the devotee's focus? Our minds are always telling us what to do. So how do you control your mind? You remember the instructions of the spiritual master. And applying the instructions of the spiritual master in each and every circumstance in our execution of devotional service brings about success in the execution of that service, even if it doesn't make sense. <laughs> because the instructions are always the means for connection with the Supreme Lord. There's no other way. Sometime, sometimes the spiritual master, just like many times devotees went to Prabhupada and asked Prabhupada certain questions, and Prabhupada said, use your intelligence. <laughs> use your intelligence. So what was Prabhupada teaching? He was teaching us, I have given you everything. Now you try to understand what I have given you and pl apply it according to your understanding like that. So there is there's two kinds of what we say mistakes. Those who follow the instructions of the spiritual master without thinking and not understanding the reasons for the instructions. 
the instructions are meant, they're given for a particular reason. And there is called rote following. Sometimes we call that just like dogmatic. The guru said this, and this is what it is. What does it mean? Well, it's what he said. That's all. But then there's those who like to speculate on whatever this, whatever is given and try to come up with their own interpretations. Well, he said this, but actually he means something different. That's the two extremes. The middle road is to take the instructions, understand them, and be able to apply them according to the execution of your particular devotional service. Like that. So, for one person it may be one way and another person may be slightly different. But ultimately the instructions are the same. And there's two kinds of instructions. There is the general instructions for everyone and there's specific instructions given to the individual devotee. <clears throat> Both are important. Some of us never got individual instructions. So therefore one should follow the general instructions and try to understand how to execute devotional service according to the application of those instructions. Therefore, association with advanced devotees is a foundation for the execution of all our devotional service. When we associate with those who are advanced, we understand by their example and by their own teachings how to apply the instructions of our spiritual master, <clears throat> like that. And then it becomes easy, like that. So the mind will go here and there, the mind will do whatever it wants to do. That's the nature of the mind. So one of the ways to control the mind is to meditate on the instructions of the spiritual master. That's one of the ways. There's many ways, but that's one, like that. So when we understand, now a lot of times when we read Prabhupada's books, even when we hear his instructions or even our own spiritual master's instructions, we are not clear. Therefore, bodhiyantas parasparam, katiyantas chibam dityan, tushyanti We should ask questions to get clarification and make sure things are understandable. A lot of times, things apparently appear contradictory. And therefore, in order to clarify the, the, the contradictions, this is important. And it also stimulates the intelligence. When the intelligence is stimulated in Krishna consciousness, it connects one to Krishna. Srila Rupa Goswami explains that, that the mind cannot connect to Krishna, but through the, the intelligence you connect the mind to Krishna. The mind can, is meant to be connected to Krishna. Savai, Savai Manasa, what is that verse? Ah, is it? Ambarish Maharaj. Sa, Savai Mana Krishna Paravada Vindaya Vai Chamsi, pardon. Ah. He used everything, all of his senses, minds, intelligence in the service of the Lord. But therefore the application is connecting the mind with the Lord, with the Lord through the instructions of the spiritual master, which is the principle of intelligence. Sometimes devotees would ask Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I don't have any intelligence. You know, a humble statement. Prabhupada said, and get some. <laughs> get the intelligence from those who actually have it, even if you don't have any. <laughs> so that's important. Not that we just try to figure things out ourselves like that. Okay, so, questions? Yes, Himanshu Prabhu. More microphone? I'll repeat your question. Okay. You connect the mind to Krishna through the intelligence. Yeah, and that's Rupa Goswami's statement. The Could you elaborate that on a little bit, please? That's a nectar of instructions. Yeah. The intelligence has to be purified. Bhakti Vinod Thakur discusses this in this 
Bhakti Loka, which is a commentary on Rupa Goswami's uh, Bhakti Rasam, no, Upadesha Amrita. And he explains that the mind, well, you know, is, is the nature of the mind is to accept and reject uh, according to what it likes and what it doesn't like. Accepting, rejecting, thinking, feeling, and willing. Now, the nature of the intelligence is discrimination. The nature of the intelligence is also doubtfulness. The intelligence will doubt something, and then it'll think about it, and then it'll try to understand it, like that. You know, just like when you t when you talk to an intelligent person, they don't just say they're not like this all the time. You, know, you see people talk. They're not an intelligent person will listen in a very critical way to what you're saying, and then they'll think about what you're saying, and then they'll make a judgment based on their discrimination like that. They don't accept things so easily. So the intelligent the mind will accept and reject according to what it likes and doesn't like. The intelligence is meant to be connected to Guru and Shastra. When the intelligence is connected to Guru and Shastra, we apply those principles to whatever we hear and experience. And then we can connect the soul through the intelligence and not through the mind. The mind will also come along, but the intelligence is the connecting force. So just to give you an example, um, you come into the temple room and you, you know, you do it you have to pay your obeisances. So obeisances is you put your head on the floor and you chant the prayers to the spiritual master. Now the mind doesn't want to do that. The mind wants to go down as fast as he can so he can get up, right? <laughs> Just wants to hurry through the end. But the intelligence says, no, do it properly. The mind looks at the deity and sees just nice colors decorations. The intelligence says, this is Krishna. <laughs> this is Krishna standing there in his transcendental form like that. So the intelligence will give us the understanding. The mind will give maybe something right, but maybe not like that. But the intelligence, if it's not connected to Shastra and Guru, will also mislead one. So purified intelligence. Not purified, but intelligence that is shastra chakshus, intelligence that sees through knowledge like that. If I, if we look at a person, what do you see? You see their body. That's the mind. But the intelligence will say, vidya vinaya sampane brahmani gavi hastini suni chaiva sapakecha panditat samadarshinaha. They see not so much the body, but they see the soul within the body. That's intelligence. The mind will see what it wants to see. So the intelligence connects one to truth, like that. Yeah, sure. Did, did, did that make sense? Makes That makes a lot of sense, actually. Um, so, in essence, one of the points that you're presenting is that th what, what separates the mind from the intelligence is that the intelligence is fed by, you know, Shastra or Guru, and the mind is fed by own prejudices or conceptions that were coming from previous yeah, lives. Maybe so. its own experiences. The mind can be right sometimes, but it'll do it'll act right and wrong based on how its own experience. Thinking, it thinks about something, gets a feeling for something, and then it acts or doesn't act. It accepts something and rejects. I like it. I don't like it. Like that. So. It, essentially, this principle that the mind has to be filled with something outside of ourself and our experience is that that applies to non devotees as well. Like their intelligence will also be strengthened by, and then the, their mind will be. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. The mind will tell you to jump off the building, the intelligence will say, don't do it. <laughs> you know, when just you see in this age, people's minds are crazy because of the nature of the age. They do the most, you know, insane things. They kill their parents, you know. People go nuts. <laughs> That's the mind. The intelli That means their intelligence is not even functioning anymore. The mind just overshadows the intelligence. 
So intelligence is discrimination. In the third canto, Sriman Bhagavatam, the qualities of the intelligence are there. What are the qualities of the intelligence? Determination, discrimination, doubtfulness, and sleep. Hmm. Sleep is also a function of the intelligence. If, the intellig if, if there's not proper sleep, the intelligence doesn't function properly. Give you an example when you're tired, <clears throat> you remember the big things and you forget the little things, right? You're standing, you're sitting in your room and you're tired and it's time to go, you have to go somewhere and you run out and then you realize you forgot the keys to the car <laughs> because you're tired. But, the, but when the intelligence is functioning, it remembers, it, it, rem it connects the mind to what it needs to remember like that. It's, it's very subtle because the the intelligence is not much different than the mind, but it's just but it's a little bit different, and is that it's this discriminating factor. Yes, Parma Karuna. It's um, it's mentioned in the third canto, Srimad Bhagavatam, that it's the function of the intelligence now the mind can also be doubtful too but the the, the 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 intelligence will doubt based on what we say what is right and wrong the mind just might doubt something because it just wants to doubt something because it doesn't like it or doesn't understand it the intelligence will try to understand it so it's slightly different both can have a doubting propensity there so, I doubt what you say, but let me think about it. That's the intelligence. When I first hear it, my mind processes it in a certain way, but then I think about it. Therefore, thoughtfulness is a prin principle of intelligence because it doesn't simply accept things readily, but it thinks in a very, it thinks about it and tries to understand it based on whatever understanding it has, like that. So when we have proper understanding through the Guru and Shastra, then we can ex understand everything, whether it's right or wrong, like that, whether it's beneficial or not beneficial. But the mind also doubts, yes. The disc, it, it, it's distinguished from the mind is such that intelligence make a doubt based Two on things. Guru and Shastra. Two things about the intelligence, determination, discrimination. If you can remember those two things. It discriminates and it's determined. The mind can't be determined. The mind can be for a while, but the mind breaks its determination depending on whether they like he likes it or not. Intelligence will be determined no matter what because he knows it's the right thing to do. Children don't have any intelligence. The parents have to be their intelligence to tell them exactly what they need to do because they're functioning according to their childlike mind. That's all. Did, I, did you get that? Yeah, that's how we, sh as devotees, that's how we should think. We don't just discriminate based on whether, in other words, there's material intelligence too. We want to change material intelligence into spiritual intelligence. That means taking the knowledge from Shastra and Guru. Okay. But sometimes Prabhupada would say, use your intelligence. And that way, mean there may also be a combination of, you know, spiritual intelligence and material intelligence together. Just like if you have to do something, it's like you have some service to do. You may have some abilities how to do it, based on your own experiences. So you apply your material intelligence and in how to do the service. But when you engage it in service, it becomes spiritual intelligence then, because it's acting for Krishna. And, uh, 
if you want to read a good book about this, it's an excellent book. It's called what is it? Vedanta Psychology. It's a small little book. It was done by Suhocha Swami many years ago. It's about that thick. Purple cover. It's called Vedanta Psychology. It has everything you need to hear about mind and intelligence in there. One of the problems we make in Krishna consciousness is we assume everybody can be trained in the same way. This is where this is where our temples are not functioning properly because we just put everybody in the same category and train them, engage them whatever way we need to engage them and train them. But individual understanding of the of a person and how best they can be trained and engaged is what makes the difference between success and failure. <laughs> like that. And it's just like... <laughs> if you t a, a Brahmin, they're detached. A Kshatriya is not detached. <laughs> People have cl inclinations in both ways, you know. De <laughs> I could use some pretty good examples. It's like in one pujari room in one temple that I know. The pujaris are mostly kshatriyas, so they're always fighting on how to worship the deity. Because <laughs> kshatriyas are just like, you know, it's got to be done this way. This is right. The Brahmins, yeah, all right. Sometimes they're just a little detached from the whole thing. So. A Vaish is thinking how to make money from whatever he does. <laughs> A Kshatriya is thinking how to get the job done in the best possible way, and the Brahmin is thinking how to become Krishna conscious in whatever I'm doing. <laughs> and a Sudra doesn't care. <laughs> the Sudra is interested in what I can get out of it. <laughs> That's what Sudra is interested in. And so, therefore, people have different tendencies and it's fun it functions according to their particular mentality like that so if you read this book by Dante psychology you get a, a broader understanding of the application of mind intelligence and how it applies in, in an individual way I mean there's people who have great ability for intellectualism and others you know they can't even read a book <laughs> Again, one example was in Gurukul. Now, Gurukul is meant to train children, but then in part of the training is to see what children are actually intelligently inclined and what are just like sudra mentality. And if you if you try to educate the sudras and give them all the teachings of the more you know intellectual children, they just become naughty. <laughs> they just cause problems, you know. So, I'm talking from experience, and both by example and from experience, is then that, that child needs to go out and do some work, where another child may need to study more. Both need to study, but if you engage all the children in the same way, you'll find you'll never properly entrain them like that. So, that's the same in an ashram, too. You know, people need to un... The temple leaders need to discriminate and understand the nature of those who they work that are working under them and how best they can be engaged. Okay. Of course, there is at the beginning there is some principle of surrender like that. But after a while, a person will gravitate towards their own nature, and that's why Prabhupada wanted Van Ashram system to train people to come up to their, to bring out their individual natures and engage in, in devotional service, that is called Daivi Vanashram. Not just Vanashram, but Daivi Vanashram, transcendental Vanashram, like that. Okay, does that help? Terence, you had a question? Thank you, Maharaj, for class. Um, I think you just addressed one of my questions, um, so I'm going to pass and let someone else speak. Okay, thank, thank you. you.
Hare Krishna. Yes, Glenn. Hmm? What What about the role of the false ego? Well, we don't want it to play any role. <laughs> we want to kick him out of the play. <laughs> That's the idea. We want the false ego is the person who is making the plans for the mind. <laughs> False ego jumps in, you know, and always gets its, tries to get a little bit of his own action in it. Yeah, I did nice service. Very well. That's the false ego. False ego means, you know, something about the mind and intelligence, the activities of the so it tries to claim some kind of credit or directs the mind and intelligence in order to fulfill its own selfish desires. False ego is anything that is not mm, real ego. Real ego is jivar sarupa vainachya krishna das. If, you th if one is thinking anything else than I am an eternal servant of the Supreme Lord, das, das, anu, das, any other thought as far as one's activities and identities are concerned, that is called a false ego. Janasa moham yam aham mameti. This is I, this is mine. These are the principles of the false ego. Okay. I am a man, a woman, a brahmachari, a sannyasi, a temple president, an intellectual. I'm old, I'm black, I'm sick. These are all principles of the false ego. The soul has no material designations. The false ego gives the soul, the living being, a designation that is called identity that is that is false. Or we might say temporary. Like that. False and temporary have the same meaning within the context of spirituality. So real ego... And the only, you know, your only identity is that we're humble servants of the servants of the servants of the servants of the servants. That's our only identity. If we think anything other than that, we have to act according to the material arrangements. In other words, we are in a man's body, so we don't, you know, go to the, stay in a woman's ashram, you know, we, <laughs> You just can't do that. You have to make make the barriers on the social and individual level. But you do you realize it's simply a role you play. You're playing a role as a man. You're not a man. You're a soul. We're playing a role as a sannyasi. We're playing a role as a temple president. We're playing a role as a brahmin. These are roles. That's all. But the roles are important for the execution of the activity. But it's still, we understand, it's a role. Who am I? That is the real ego. I am Krishna's servant eternally. It can't be anything else. <laughs> That's real ego. So it's easy to understand what the false ego is. It's very hard to understand how to get rid of it. <laughs> because, you know, it's like... I'll give you an example of a false ego. I'm so humble, I'm proud of it. <laughs> I'm humble. If you think like that, that's false ego. A humble person will not think they're humble. An intelligent person doesn't think they're intelligent. An advanced person doesn't think they're advanced. So the false ego will say, yeah, I'm advanced. <laughs> but we get, the, we get the words from the great souls. Amara jivan, sare pape rate, nahi opo yera lesa. Bhakti Vinota Kaur, amara jivan, my life, sade, always, pape, sinful. 
is full with sinful activities. My life is full of sinful activity. He, that's one song he writes, Bhakti Vinod Thakur. So do we believe that about him? No. Is he thinking that about himself? Yes. That a little bit? Does that help? Okay. You had a question over there? No? I thought, I'm sorry. I thought I saw your hand up. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, I have one question. Thing is... Nice and loud. <laughs> Slow and yeah. loud. Thing question is that in ninth canto we see Prabhupada has written uh, five people like Brahmana, then woman, cow. Ch child, cow. and old, old man, and cow. Mm -hmm. They should not be punishable. They are not regarded as punishable. Right. So here question is coming when Lord Ramachandra he banished mm. Mother Sita. So he punished her. <laughs> so this is some little contradiction. Yeah, the Lord breaks parent lower principles for a higher principle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. And another thing, Maharaj, I want to add that in the Bhagavad Gita there is a nice verse that above the body is mind, above the mind is intelligence, and above that the intelligence is soul, soul yeah. and then our super soul, Krishna. Yeah. So, and again, Krishna is telling that regarding false ego that. Uh, Ahankara ityamanya bhina prakritra astara means false ego is also one type of energy of Krishna. Yeah, and there's the indication of what the false ego does. The false ego says, I'm doing this. So, now it's really bewildering when you hear from Shastra because mm, that verse, prakriti kriya manani guni karmani sarvash ahankara vimura kartaham. Karta means doer. Kartaham iti manyate. So who is the actual karta? So the individual soul is not considered to be karta. But in the 18th chapter, Krishna mentions that the, the, the living entity is karta. And then in the 4th chapter, Krishna says, I am not karta. In the 18th chapter, he also says, I'm karta. <laughs> Welcome to Krishna consciousness. <laughs> It's never that clear. So what do you do? The living entity is part of the activity, but not the complete doer. And that's explained in the 17th chapter, There's or 18th chapter of Gita, that there are five factors of action, and one of them is the individual soul. But without the other four factors, action cannot take place. And what consummates action is the super soul. Like that. So, but the super soul is not really doing anything either. He's, either. he's only giving sanctions to the action, that's all. Or not, neither one. Like that. So it's a very subtle principle. You can understand it. It's clear when you understand the dynamics of activity like that. You know, it's just like if you don't do something, then you don't get Krishna's mercy. But it's Krishna's mercy that makes things happen or don't happen. So your effort brings about the act, the mercy, and not simply your effort is the the all in all. See the difference? But if you don't make the effort, the mercy doesn't come. So you have to try. So to sum it up. You have to act like it depends on you, and you have to know it doesn't. <laughs> you can get that, then you, it's all clear. You have to act like it depends on you, but you have to know that it does not.
Okay. All right. Anything else? Yes, Derek. Did you get my article on faith? Okay. I was wondering uh, if you could clarify how to properly see through the eyes of Sastra. Because I'm thinking whenever we're reading Sastra or hearing from Guru, we're still hearing our reading through a filter of yeah. what's applicable to us. And therefore, questions and clarifications are important. That you'll, even though you're hearing, you may apply it in the wrong way or not completely in the right way. Yeah. So what to do is that and get a clarification. Prabhupada said, if you're sure about something, then go ahead. But if there's the slightest amount of doubt, don't do it. Mm, get clarification before you act like that. That's that's the importance of a sadhu sangha association with devotees. They help us understand how to do things like that. So get get help. It's nice, but the mind doesn't want to do that. Mind thinks, "Hey, man, I got it. <laughs> I'm cool." I can figure it out. I made it this far. <laughs> I'm hip. <laughs> no, and, you know, the mind will always, you know, want to not take help. but Because for the mind, that's embarrassing. Mind wants to think, I can do it. Especially in Western societies, the self-made man, right? The individual rugged indi person who can, you know, climb mountains without anything, you know. It's just, this is the Western society. Prabhupada used to chastise us Americans. He says, you're all Americans. Therefore, you should do something great for Krishna. Because <laughs> he knew the Americans have this mentality of, you know, wanting to do something great. <laughs> That's the American mentality. Individual, individualism, individualism. It's so strong in in Western countries, especially in America. Individualism. <clears throat> but you see, in, in Vedic culture, everything is done in a communal way. Like that, generally. Okay. Anything else before we stop? All right. Thank you. Srila Prabhupada Ki Taita? Mm-hmm.